All right, ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to Louis B. Free Radio Show, Brain Food from the Heartland. I am thrilled to have the author of A Poison Like No Other, How Microplastics Corrupted Our Planet and Our Bodies, Matt Simon as our guest. Matt, good morning to you. Uh, Likewise, thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. And of course, the work that you do. Let's talk a little bit about you and your background leading up. Let's go way back. Tell us about Certainly. it. Certainly. I'll make it very yeah. Yeah. Sure. I'm a, I'm a science journalist. I live in San Francisco. Um, I have been at Wired for about a dozen years now. Um, I like to describe myself as being our resident doomsday writer uh, because I write about climate like change that. and other environmental issues. Um, and for the past couple of years, five, five or six years, I have been writing about microplastics, this kind of burgeoning new field in science um, about how these tiny particles uh, have gotten absolutely everywhere. So um, I kind of transitioned all of that, uh, you know, piecemeal reporting here and there on microplastics into a more cohesive treatment of it in this book, which is, uh, I think, really kind of a state of the science here. What scientists know so far about the extent of microplastic pollution, but now increasingly turning towards, okay, well, what are the consequences of this ubiquitous pollutant? What what led you to science writing and to being the the uh, crown doomsday <laughs> issue writer? Sure. It's, uh, I think, just curiosity. Um, I think we're in this really interesting time when we have, uh, I actually say science has, so many more powerful tools for discovery, for finding out more about our world. And um, I, I didn't start with the doomsday stuff. I, I used to report more on biology, uh, which is what my first two books were about. Uh, other things like robotics, which is in more keeping with the traditional wired coverage. Um, but I have since become uh, the doomsday writer <laughs> because there are um, a lot of really interesting, I think, perhaps seemingly esoteric um, climate stories that I think Wired is very well equipped to cover. Um, The ultra nerdy stuff that I I think a lot of other outlets might shy away from, um, but we are very much into that sort of thing. Again, your your first two books, Play to the Living Dead, uh, What Real Life Zombies Reveal About Our World and Ourselves and Brainwash the Caterpillar. Uh, also, and those books are, of course, they're all available everywhere and everywhere online. As I always urge people, please try to buy it as close to home as possible. Select, support, uh, the, even the Matt. My my change has been over the years. I would just ask people, please, independent, order it through an independent, get it an independent. Now realizing with after COVID or through COVID, so many independents have closed, and I thought, you know, even the Barnes and Nobles are employing local people and keeping local economy going but but yet i shouldn't say but yet available of course amazon and all the places on online for quick delivery also a poison like no other how microplastics corrupted our planet and our bodies Um, mike simon's book mike simon.net that's mike simon.net and by the way i just love the uh the one picture at website where it says i'm the one on the left and folks you're going to have to go and look to see that one picture with yeah mm. i go see it it's i cracked me up when i saw that <laughs> and also i wired all the lists of a lot of the uh, the blogs etc that uh and writings that you've done with the microplastics something that people i i, I considered myself not knowledgeable, but aware of what's going on with plastics. And I've been freaked out by plastics in general for just a long time. I love glass. I love getting things in glass as opposed to plastic. That's not always available these days. And I've worked, but I didn't know the extent of it, and especially the microplastics, the problem, the BPA. I know we're going to talk about that. Tell me a little bit about the research for you. 
it was alarming. Um, I am an idiot, and I decided to start writing this oh, book. During you're not an idiot, young man. Um, it's not an no, idiot. but I was, I was sitting around with nothing better to do. I thought, let me feel worse about the state of the world and and do a, a, a metric ton of research on on plastic pollution. Um, but yeah, so I, I dug deeply into the literature here and uh, spoke to over 100 microplastic scientists who are really at the forefront of this field. Again, a burgeoning field because scientists didn't really understand the full extent of microplastic pollution until quite recently. Um, really the past five to 10 years, um, we have, first of all, we started finding it in the ocean, um, which is reasonable because we wash our clothing. These are synthetic clothing that have these fibers break off and flush out to sea. That's where the, the research began, but has since really morphed into this more holistic whole earth approach, which is that we are now finding it all over the land. Uh, it is thoroughly saturated in the atmosphere, uh, thoroughly. There's a ton of it in the atmosphere uh, blowing above our heads. It is also very common in indoor air, actually something like six times the amount of microplastics in indoor air versus outdoor air, because we are absolutely surrounded with all these different sources of plastic. The sneaky stuff too, right? So it's like, obviously bottles and bags, that sort of thing. But two thirds of clothing is now made out of plastic. That's stuff like polyester and nylon. And we are just beginning to scratch the surface of the human health impacts, um, which um, those studies are gonna come out in the next, again, five, five, 10 years to, I think, link um, some human health issues to microplastic pollution, because we know that we're breathing lots of these fibers. One estimate was 7,000 fibers a day that we are inhaling. Uh, a lot of that is getting stuck in our lung tissue. And it has, uh, as you mentioned, it comes with all these different chemicals like BPA, um, but 10,000 other chemicals have been used in plastics and we have almost no data on what that means for human health. I can tell you for a certainty that it is not good. It's certainly not good. And uh, discovering more and more, I highly recommend the book. It's so informative. And I know there are people, when I was talking about uh, your book uh, a week or so ago, and someone said, oh, you know, I don't want to hear all the negative stuff. I, you, you know, I, and that, I understand that there may be a certain time of the day that you don't want to read about it. That I, I, I get it's like, yeah, or cert, like certain movies. And I don't want to watch that kind of movie. Now. Let me watch something a little bit more lighthearted on Turner Classic Movies. But the reality is, is I know the overused expression, knowledge is power. We need to know. I mean, you'd want to know the way I say it, Matt Simon, is if I'm driving down a road and there's a washed out bridge uh, coming up quickly, I you want to know. You want to know what dangers are present or that lie ahead. You need to be educated on it. And it's not written in a way to... It's written with facts, not a, a way to horrify you on every page, although a lot of the information is horrifying. <laughs> As I didn't mean for it to be, but yes, yes. I mean, it's, it's, it is, a, a, again, a review of the literature, what we know so far about this pollution. And um, I, I, I don't want to depress people with it, but we need to begin to fight back against the industry here. Um, we need to know the consequences of this pollution, not only for human health, but for whole ecosystems. There is not a square inch of this planet that is not tainted by microplastics because so much of it is in the atmosphere. Um, what are the consequences of that? Mitigate that pollution. Uh, first and foremost, it's about just using less plastic in the end. There's lots of other mitigation measures we can do, filters on washing machines, that sort of thing. But we need to start getting much angrier at the corporations that have really corrupted every corner of this planet with this pollutant. Yeah, and and it's uh, yeah, not to I guess it's not digressing. A lot of people think, well, you know, I'm recycling my plastics, and I'm a I'm a big recycler. I I'm like that. My neighbors certainly know the volumes of recycling, and I'm stunned that I'm how much recycling just two people, what you just the two of us have every. Every day, every week, every two weeks when they pick up. I, I, By the way, the dedication to planet Earth, sorry about the mess, is great. 
it was real makes you smile and then you think about it, it's like wow yeah this is of course it's it's all of us when you write about uh that was a, I, I loved I loved the introduction and, and I know we don't have as much a wealth of time but I love how you first go into it and talk about some places where you would think wouldn't but you find do as you said Matt Simon about how uh, not a square inch in the world isn't that doesn't have some of the plastic pollution. Yeah, and it's, in, in the introduction, I I talk about going to Utah to a, a remote mountaintop with U in Utah with a plastic scientist who has this instrument on top of this mountain. Um, I'm not an outdoorsy type. I talk about how it was very difficult for me to get to the top of this mountain. <laughs> it's quite remote. Um, and uh, she has these little instruments positioned throughout the American West in these remote stretches. And she is quantifying just how much of this stuff is falling out of the sky. And she published a paper um, a couple of years back where she described it as plastic rain and calculated that the equivalent of something like 300 million plastic bottles fall on Western protected areas each year. Those are protected, not the whole Western United States, but that's 6% of the total land area of the United States. The equivalent of 300 million bottles fall out of the sky as microplastic uh, each year. So scaling that up, that means billions of bottles are falling on just the United States each year. It's, a, it's stunning. It's horrifying. And quite frankly, it's embarrassing what we have done here to this planet. This is um it's it's i had an interviewer actually describe it as this really this alien substance that we have introduced the environment i think that's a great way to put it it's it's quite strange it's it's uh, i call it a pollutant like no other because it's it's just it's this physical thing right because because it's falling out of the sky it can actually have bacteria and viruses that glom onto it um, as it's floating around the environment um, it might actually be influencing atmospheric dynamics might be acting as nuclei to attract water vapor, to brighten clouds and change the climate. Um, it is in beaches. There's been some studies that have found that it, it raises the temperature of sand quite significantly. Um, and it can actually affect then uh, sea turtles, which uh, have this thing called sex determination. The hotter it is, the more females come out of the clutch. Uh, you are finding 100% of these, sometimes of these clutches are turning out female because of climate change, but also are microplastics actually contributing to that? It is this alien substance that we have introduced to the planet um, unwittingly, um, but we're just now coming to terms with the consequences and they are absolutely massive. We, uh, let's talk about the consequences a bit. Yeah. So, massive, uh, but of course you can read about it. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I think um, a really interesting one to talk about is uh, the implications for the carbon cycle in the ocean. So you have in the ocean these little tiny animals called plankton. Um, they eat a bunch of uh, ph phytoplankton, which is uh, essentially little tiny plants floating around out there. They poop um, and that carbon actually then sinks to the seafloor. And that's a a, a giant sink of carbon. It actually takes a lot of the carbon from the atmosphere and sequesters it away. But scientists are not finding that these plankton are also eating a lot of microplastic. And in this really subtle and kind of fascinating way, um, because plastic is, is not very dense, it actually changes the density of their fecal pellets um, with all that carbon. It actually can slow the speed with which these pellets sink to the seafloor, that then allows more critters in that water column to eat that carbon before it is sequestered away. So it could, like, that's a subtle but potentially massive problem that we could have with microplastics beyond the fact that these are little bits of poison that could be poisoning these creatures. They are, again, physical things that can get stuck in the digestive system and fill up their stomachs with non-food, decreasing their appetite for actual food. There could be all these crazy knock-on effects that we just have not fully come to terms with that can have massive consequences for the climate, um, for the health of ecosystems, and for the health of people. <sighs> You can read more about it, a lot about it in the book and learn a lot. A poison like no other, how microplastics corrupted our planet and our bodies. Uh, the author, Simon, it's an island press book. So, of course, 
available everywhere and everywhere online. A lot of the things, that the, the chemicals and the things, and again, we talked about uh, the BPA briefly and some of the other uh, uh, issues with that. I remember a number of, I can't remember how many years ago, Matt, uh, where there was a, issues with in baby bottles, the, the BPA, even without the BPA, there, there's issues. Tell us a little bit more about the chemicals in plastic. If you will. I think that's actually one of the most scarier studies was the the one that was done a couple of years ago on on baby bottles and these scientists were actually able to quantify when you create the the baby formula in a bottle uh, with with hot water um, just how many particles actually come off of that plastic and they, they quantified that a baby could be drinking a million uh, particles of, of plastic a day if you were preparing the, the hot formula in plastic uh, obviously you want to be Going forward, please prepare it in glass and then transfer it once it's cooled down into plastic if need be. Um, so we then have to start thinking about, okay, we know that there are at least 10,000 chemicals uh, used in plastics. The industry didn't tell us that, by the way. Chemists had to actually reverse engineer plastics because there's no ingredient list on a baby bottle, right? Like they, the industry wouldn't want us to, to know because- They wouldn't want to- <laughs> Yeah, these chemicals weren't- like they didn't test them on humans. They just put them in products and put them out into the marketplace. And we know for a fact that many of these, these chemicals and plastics are toxic to humans. Uh, something like a quarter of those 10,000 chemicals, uh, scientists consider to be of concern, meaning they're either straight up toxic, we know they're toxic, um, or they're persistent in the environment um, or persistent in our bodies. So. We are now in this uh, extreme urgency to figure out um, what those chemicals are doing to human health. The issue with something like BPA is that you can phase that out, um, right? And then you can replace it with a, a different chemical, which is oftentimes very similar in structure, um, as toxic, if not more toxic. So we're substituting in these terrible alternatives. That is one chemical among the 10,000 in, in plastics that we know have been used so far. So- one, Excuse me for if you, one 10,000. I just, I yeah. want to echo that. And, 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 like, and again, a quarter of those 10,000 scientists considered to be of concern. So something like 2,500 that we, that we know of. Um, so the, the primary concern here is a group of chemicals called endocrine disrupting chemicals. These are also called EDCs. Um, these make the human- endocrine system, our hormone system, go haywire. Uh, and their dosing works in this really insidious and, and interesting way in that we're typically used to a poison as something that, uh, you know, increase the dose, it becomes more poisonous. Like even aspirin is poison if you, if you take a lot of it. EDCs work fundamentally differently, where even at a very, very low dose, they can be highly toxic. Uh, and then as you increase the dose, that toxicity goes down, but then at the higher end, um, with a lot of a, a, a dose, that actually goes back up again. So it's actually this U shape if you plot it on a graph. So if these are extremely toxic, even in low doses, we have these tiny particles um, that the plastics industry might say, oh, well, they're you know small. Uh, maybe it isn't affecting human health that much. But even in very small doses, these, these chemicals are extremely problematic. BPA is one of them, um, but there are a whole range of others. We have almost no data on what that means for human health. We know, we know that those chemicals on their own terrible for human health. That's proven. But are the microplastics in our lungs and in our digestive systems enough of a dose to cause a problem? Um, that will be research that we need going forward. We desperately need going forward. We need that that research. You 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 uh, wrote about, and again, I was talking about the the uh, baby ball that but I'd read years ago. You, you write about that in your book about the FDA banning uh, the use of in baby bottles and sippy cups. And then the study that you also uh, talk about, about the, the teethers, the, the nooks, the whatever they're calling them today, that, that, that babies suck on. And the, yeah. and the amount, oh, that again, it's all horrifying. When you think of a baby, you think about exposing a baby to that. Yeah. And it's the, 
the brutal thing is that plastics were always pitched to us as these benign materials, right? But it's it's sanit it's in fact sanitary. Like these are actually making things safer for our infants. Um, but these they just put these chemicals in these plastics and put them in the marketplace without testing it. So the issue with with um, banning something like BPA is, as you say, there's these things are still showing up. Like groups will do tests of products um, that they buy online, and it says BPA free. Oh, it turns out there is BPA in it because there's just like there's really no oversight here. Um, but that doesn't even consider what we're inhaling, right? So like you can have a product that's completely BPA free. If, you know, might be kind of rare that that actually <laughs> happens. Um, but what about our clothing? So we are producing, by one calculation, something like a billion fibers a year from our clothing just by walking around. That is settling on the floor and is an indoor dust. We're inhaling it. These are chemicals never meant for human consumption. It's not food grade plastic, which yeah, yeah. in and of itself is, is problematic. <laughs> but you also think about like car tires. Car tires are made out of synthetic rubber. It's a technically kind of plastic. That's a major source of microplastics into the environment. When you're walking down the street, you're inhaling bits of car tire. And these tire companies, I don't think ever thought, well, what if humans are consuming our tires? Like <laughs> There's yeah. no such thing as a food grade tire, right? Um, so we are coming to grips with that, that we, even if you're not eating a plastic, even if it's a baby uh, not chewing on a plastic, uh, like a, a teeth for a, a baby bottle, what what does this mean for human health if we're inhaling these things constantly, eating them constantly, drinking them constantly um, with all these different chemicals? We don't know. And that's the scary bit to me, just we're in this scary period where we, we don't have enough data, but scientists are... are urgently rushing to figure this out um, because the consequences could be massive. And the consequences could be massive. A lot of the things that we don't know, when you talked about that with uh, about the uh, the clothing and breathing and things, breathing things, it, it, those were things I hadn't even thought about, about how much in the air. Yeah. Be, and and, it's, and yeah. It's, it's because the, the, the industry surrounded us with plastic in these sneaky ways that we didn't realize. I don't think very many people realize that two thirds of clothing are now made out of plastic. Um, those fibers are breaking off constantly, either flushing out to sea in our washing machines or around the home, like pouches, carpets. Hardwood floors, um, you know, made out of vinyl. Unless you're really rich and can afford like a pure wood for your for your house, your hardwood floors are made out of probably some kind of plastic. There's there's been some good calculations on that producing a good amount of microplastics that are then taken up into the air. So carpet or hardwood, it's an issue. They the industry has absolutely surrounded us with plastics, um, with no research as to what that might mean for human health. Um, but we know that there are plenty of toxic chemicals in plastics. And again, the, the frightening thing, the, no research. We don't know. We, you know. We'll find out down the road and that could be too late for you know, we yeah. don't know, all the medical issues it could cause, et cetera. I'm talking with Matt Simon, his book, A Poison Like No Other, How Microplastics Corrupted Our Planet and Our bodies when you you again talking about that with breathing it and we're drinking it and it's all around there is nowhere to be there's nowhere to go <laughs> you know, I, I, how do i want to say it matt there's it's not like there's no safe space to be no. awake from all of this nowhere to hide the yeah nowhere the, to hide thank you the scare, the, here's the thing is like you can be an uncontacted tribe in the amazon rainforest that is exposed to microplastic because it's falling out of the sky in such quantities um that's that's wild and then i mean here's an interesting thought experiment so we have a lot of these particles floating around the environment in the ocean that they they gather what's known as a plastosphere. So this is a bunch of organisms that actually glom onto the plastics, uh, bacteria, viruses. Um, it's actually this really thriving, interesting ecosystem. Um, you could have a particle that a fish eats that passes through a fish's digestive system, gathers up the viruses and bacteria there, uh, the fish poops it out. That particle can then very easily take back to the air in ocean spray 
blow onto land, and at some point you might inhale a microplastic that has gone through a fish's digestive system. I'm not saying that anybody yes. has, but this is a thought experiment, but that we well, scientists have shown very clearly that these particles very readily move between these domains. So between the ocean and the sky and the land, it's this great big cycle um, that, that really just came to light in the past couple of years. Um, but not only worrying about the chemicals, in these plastics themselves, but what has been attracted to these particles as they've moved through the environment. They've actually also been shown to uh, readily accumulate heavy metals like lead and mercury in the environment. Um, is that then dosing us with extra amounts of that? Um, all outstanding uh, research questions that we, we really need to figure out in the coming years. And once again, Matt, and, and quickly, I, I, I appreciate you saying the coming years, we need to get on it before it's, we need to deal with it before it's too late. And exactly. I, we, need the, know, we need the precautionary principle, right? Like we, we know enough right now to be terrified um, about this, this stuff. Uh, we know enough to be able to just reduce our dependence on plastic, which has all number of, of benefits, right? Beyond human health, like this stuff is flowing in tremendous quantities into the environment and poisoning ecosystems. Uh, we will not lose anything by getting rid of single use plastics. It was not that long ago in human history where we were getting along just fine without it. I'm, I'm 38, mm -hmm. I remember a time when we weren't surrounded by this much plastic. We can very easily go back to that. Um, and that's gonna be the challenge is pushing back against a plastics industry um, and a fossil fuel industry that sees the writing on the wall with decarbonization, right? So we're going to move away from fossil fuels as fuels. They want to hook us more on fossil fuels as plastics. Um, that's going to be the massive ramp up in production, exponential ramp up. It's going to triple by 2050. Uh, we are producing a trillion pounds of plastic a year. That is three trillion pounds by 2050. Um, where is that all going? A lot of it into the environment. And that's that's the urgency too, is that we already have what's out there poisoning these ecosystems, but we're going to have a lot more in the coming years. So an organism that might not be suffering with the current concentrations in the environment, say like a, a copepod, a, a little a, a plankton in the ocean, could very well in the next five, 10 years, as these concentrations increase exponentially in the environment, they can take sediment samples and they have looked back to the 1940s and have shown and plotted perfectly on a graph the exponential increase in plastics production maps perfectly with the exponential increase in microplastic particles in sediments that's that's the true urgency is that this is already out of control and it's going to get out of control if we let the industry keep getting away with this i, I do want to address that uh, uh, in just in just a bit, one of the things I was talking about the recycling before, and thinking about it more, and again reading your book, and there was a report, and I, again I can't remember how how long not not that long ago, but how the small percentage of things that we plastics that we recycle that we put in the recycling bins, I should say, don't end up getting recycled. And then reading your book, I'm thinking about the process of recycling them releases you're the expert in this not me but it, it, there, there's nothing good about the plastic there's a no matter how much you we try and want to mitigate i guess i should it, it, we're not as, as long as we're buying them as long as manufacturing them they're negatively impacting us Sure. Yeah. And, you know, the, the plastics industry loves the idea of recycling that they sold us on the idea of recycling as a personal responsibility issue um, that, you know, it's our fault as consumers that so much of this stuff is escaping into the environment. If we would only recycle more, um, that wouldn't be an issue. The problem is that historically about 9% of plastics have been recycled. Um, that is even worse now in the United States. We are recycling 5% of our plastic. Um, what we have been doing in recent years is shipping a lot of the stuff to China in particular. Um, China a couple of years ago said, no, we don't want your plastic waste anymore. But we're now shipping to other low income developing countries that are trying to recycle that the best they can, but more often just burning it and letting it escape into the environment. They're overburdened with the trash that we are we are sending them. It's just because it's like it's not that recycling has been impossible. It has not been profitable. And that's the supreme perversion here. Yes. 
of sure. capitalism, right? It's like, we're totally happy producing this stuff. Um, the industry is, I should say, um, but totally uninterested in actually finding a solution for the waste stream. So like recycling going forward, it's going to be, I think, more important. It, it should be massive taxes on these corporations to fund better recycling programs, but we also can't let them use recycling as an out, as an excuse to keep producing more plastic if only we can just recycle more of it. We need to massively curtail the amount of plastic that we are producing. And that was a, a discussion last week in, in the plastics treaties negotiations. Uh, they're thinking about some sort of cap on plastics production because it is increasing exponentially. Recycling cannot keep up with that. And we cannot use recycling um, as this cure-all because it is it is not just the way that it has been set up. We just need to stop producing so much plastic. But again, we're up against very powerful, yeah, uh, very rich corporations. Uh, we need to elect politicians that understand um, this catastrophe, that, that plastics and climate are intricately linked. You can't really solve one without solving the other. Um, that's going to be key going forward. And, and I'm not going to get a political at one side or, or the other, uh, one party or the other, because they are both guilty of it. the lobbyists, how things are set up um, in too many cases don't benefit us, but the corporations. And that that's a, that's a massive problem that needs fixed also. The buzzwords, like you said, Matt Simon, again, it's mattsimon.net. The buzzwords that we hear about recycling and this is and get hooked on it. It's a responsibility, and yet it's the how ineffective it is. Uh, just what you all well, can buy. Well, I can recycle it. I can recycle it. The other one you write about biodegradable. You know, you say, "Oh, good, that's biodegradable." Not thinking about what that actually means. Can you talk about that a minute. Yeah, what does what does that mean? Uh, it means something very specific, which is that a, a biodegradable say, bag that you get for your compost is biodegradable under a certain set of conditions, and that is usually under very high temperatures. So in an industrial composting facility, not what you have in a bin in the backyard. Um, it breaks down fine, maybe in those uh, high temperature conditions, but it breaks into microplastics all the same. A, a biodegradable bag is a is a plastic. It's not this wonderful plant-based um, material that will very nicely diffuse into the environment. Um, it is a plastic loaded with all kinds of chemicals, the same kinds of chemicals that are in traditional plastics. Um, so you then have an issue. Okay, well, if that biodegradable bag escapes into the ocean, those are conditions that is not at all suited to break down in. Um, there was a, a really interesting study that actually um, these scientists buried um, some of these biodegradable bags in, and, and kept some of them in seawater and found that they just didn't really break down at all in, in a reasonable amount of time. So biodegradable means under a certain set of conditions. And then you also have bioplastics, which are a little bit different. Bioplastics are are made out of carbon from plants, uh, like corn and sugar, instead of carbon from fossil fuels as in traditional plastics. Um, there is this push to switch to bioplastics, uh, which sounds nice and, and cuddly, bio, look, gotta love that, um, except to meet the demand to replace regular plastics with bioplastics, you have to grow an extraordinary amount of plant material uh, that comes with a lot of emissions that uses a lot of water it uses a lot of land that we need to use to grow food for, for people so this always comes back every step of the way to the solution is to not make plastic that's it um, but we're up again against these very powerful forces that would really rather prefer making more and more plastic to increase their profits it's horrifying. Again, I highly recommend the book. You need to read the book, A Poison Like No Other, How Microplastics Corrupted Our Planet and Our Bodies. Matt Simon, mattsimon.net. And then press book available everywhere and everywhere online. I want to, uh, uh, Terry Walters, a wonderful, amazing uh, author, uh, author uh, with us now, Jack, shop around the corner. Appreciate you and you all. I shouldn't start naming some that I don't name others and people get upset. The the issue with that when you're talking about it with producing more and how deceptive things are, what can we do? 
Which we which can is? first and for, foremost get angry. We have to be angry about this because yeah. this um, we've been bamboozled um, by this industry that that again that that the we would think the plastics are safe. They are not safe. Um, they thought that recycling um, is a, a, a consumer issue, and it is not. It's about these companies producing way too much plastic. Um, I talk in the book about really, I think the most impactful thing you can do is to, you know, maybe uh, donate time or, or money to anti-plastics groups who have much more political power than we do as individuals. They're the ones that are actually going to be at you know, plastics treaties negotiations. Um, they're the ones going to be lobbying politicians um, to to take action here. Uh, I I talk at length in the book about personal responsibility being great. Like you should definitely use less plastic um, in your daily life um, to just be more conscious of it. But we can't let the plastics industry do the same thing that the fossil fuel companies did with climate change, which was, oh, it's your fault as a consumer. You should fly less and then we're going to solve climate. No, it's a systemic problem with climate change and systemic problem with plastics pollution. We are all well and good to, to do our own individual things. And actually by word of mouth, that can actually um, be quite impactful. Um, if more people start you know, installing washing machine filters to capture uh, the fibers before they get out to sea, all well and good, um, but we need massive change on a, on a wide scale beyond the individuals. And I think the plastics, anti-plastics groups are, are going to be best at facilitating that um, because that the the urgency is that the industry is going to keep producing exponentially more plastic. We cannot let them do that because the world is drowning in this stuff in in ways that we didn't realize until you know five or ten years ago when we really began to learn the extent of microplastic pollution. Always thought of as bottles and bags floating around. That's terrible. <laughs> It is much more insidious than that. It's much more thorough than that. Um, and we, we need huge change by way of, of politics because we're, we're, they're not going to stop producing plastic out of the kindness of their heart. Yeah, certainly not. Certainly not. There, there's no ethics in that. Uh, I don't want to say no. I'm sure there are some people that are trying to ha be ethical and behave ethical. I'm not sure. Actually, I, I, I shouldn't say I'm sure. I'd like to believe there, but they're they're in the industry. They're not going to uh, minimize or, or find an, an I don't know another technology. Who knows? It was one of those things again. Reading your book, and I've had this discussion, Matt Simon, with a lot of people. Well, you know, if you now at the at the grocer, you can get the plastic bag, uh, and of course, recycle it. Which when I have them, I do yet. The percentage is small, and what do they do, and what's the cost of recycling? Uh, environmental cost is what I mean, uh, et cetera. So you take paper or plastic. We get that, and I've had that discussion many times. Well, then you're cutting down the trees. So the, the, the plastics, the impact of the environment, the brain, the impact of the brain, because we know about the heavy metals. Um, do can you mention a little bit about the effect or what we do know? Matt Simon about the effect of the microplastics in our, for in our brain. Yeah, so there's good studies on um, mice and on fish. So if you feed mice and fish uh, nanoplastics in particular, um, we haven't even spoken, we haven't talked about nanoplastics yet. Nanoplastics, uh, microplastics are defined yeah. as a bit smaller than five millimeters, about the width of a, a pencil eraser. Nanoplastics are smaller than a millionth of a meter, um, imperceptibly small. Uh, and the, that does not mean that they are not everywhere. They're in huge concentrations in the environment and in, in indoor air. Uh, so if you feed these little tiny particles um, to mice and fish, they cross through the gut into the bloodstream and into the brain. They cross what's known as the, the blood-brain barrier, which is there to keep out nasties from, from the brain. So um, I, I speak to a scientist in the in the book who is kind of waiting for the studies to find nanoplastics in the human brain. It's just very difficult to find them, to, to tease them apart from the tissues in the human brain. Uh, he's almost certain that we will, we will find it there. And I, I don't find any reason to doubt that. It, it, these things are so small that they not only pass into the bloodstream quite easily, they can get into individual cells. Um, that I think that's that could potentially be a problem in the human brain, obviously. Um, but we we don't have the studies on on what that means. But we know that on fish and mice models that you do see behavioral changes at, at high doses of these nanoplastics. Um, but you know, 
the amount of nanoplastics that we're surrounded with day to day, is that enough to cause issues in the brain? These have chemicals that are are linked to uh, neurodegenerative disorders. And yes. but again, how much is too much, right? So that's what where we need much more research and to put in place um, mitigation measures if we do find that this is you know linked to brain disorders or any number of other things like asthma, lung cancer, uh, digestive cancers, that sort of thing. We need much more studies. Um, unfortunately, because fossil fuel industries have captured um, uh, American politics and American academia in some cases. Um, we don't have that much research here, but in Europe, they're actually making much more progress. They're doing way more human health studies over there, and we'll start to see good data in the coming years. It just takes a, it takes a while to, to do this. Um, it's going to be solid science when it does come out, which would be good. Um, but yeah, the weight is kind of excruciating, isn't it? And I, again, I think, uh, you know, will it be too late? Yeah, you know, will it be... Again, I want to be an optimistic that if we get this done, there's no waiting anymore. There's there's no waiting anymore. I mean, even I read uh, in your book about plastics. I'm sorry about plastics in uh, spices and salt and, and it's everywhere. Breathing, it, tr drinking it, and some when you're talking about neurodegenerative, we don't know. When, as I read about it, and I've taken up uh, an increased interest in some of those uh, diseases uh, more recently. What there's so many that we don't know the cause of. We don't know the cause of, and will that be revealed? I shouldn't mention any because I have to, but but the plat neurodegenerative. Let me just say it. The dement. I am going to say uh, Alzheimer's. The the uh, um, uh, dementia. Diff Who knows? We don't know, and that's why we've got to take action so so quickly. And again, you you write all about it in a poison like no other. How microplastics corrupted our planet and our bodies, a Mike Simon's book. Again, it's mattsimon.net, mattsimon.net for a wealth of information. But get the book and read the book and share the information. Actually, I am going to say, because it's the holiday season, someone may look at you funny if you gift it to them. <laughs> Yet, if they read it, they will certainly get back to you and want to talk about it. And that's how... It's got to happen. There's got to be that that groundswell of people. And you're leading that with the book and getting the information out, Matt Simon. Uh, if, if you can hold on one minute, I appreciate you being on. I want to say one thing to you quickly off air. I hope we can do this again. The importance of Certainly. it cannot overstate it. Matt Simon, mattsimon.net, a poison like no other. How microplastics corrupted our planet and our bodies. I will be back with some closing words in just a couple of minutes on the Louis B. Free Radio Show, Brain Food from the Heartland, Copyright B. Free Radio Limited 2022, produced by the lovely Miss Buddy Face in cooperation with White Rabbit Productions. So back, folks. Second, Matt. Uh, uh, uh.